many ways, consultants get a bad rap. They're seen as people who like to tell people what to do, but they don't actually do the work. Many people look at consulting as a four-letter word, but consultants can play valuable roles in helping companies move forward and be successful. They fill gaps, help clients seize opportunities, and de-risk strategic and tactical initiatives. And I would argue that consultants play key roles amid volatile economic times by giving companies financial, strategic, and tactical flexibility. You can hire a consultant when needed and then part ways amicably. It's a win-win proposition. Today, I'm going to dive into the consulting world with Fahim Musa, who helps consulting business owners add $100,000 to $500,000 in revenue, wouldn't that be nice, in 12 months or less without burning out. Welcome to Marketing Spark. Hey, great to be here, Mark. Thanks for having me. I'd like to start by getting your take on the consulting landscape, given the economic conditions. Is it tough times for consultants or are there opportunities for consultants to fill, to fill gaps when every dollar is being counted? Here's how I think about that. I think that as, uh, as for any business, right, uh, whether, you're, whether you have a consulting business or any other type of business, when times change, you've got to look internally and um, figure out what the best approach is for your business to achieve uh, its objectives. So for the, for consulting businesses, it's, uh, it's the same, right? Like I would argue that there are opportunities um, if you look for them, but consultants have to take the bull by the horns and uh, look internally and externally, understand, um, you know, how they're positioned in the market, who they're, customer really is what their what the needs are in the marketplace and position them accordingly and to go out and get business so um things are changing right now as you know as you just mentioned and uh, i i think that for like as any business would do consult 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 consultants also should make sure that they really study the market and move forward uh, accordingly before we uh, started recording this podcast, one of the things we talked about was the new realities for consultants. And I would argue over the last two years, it's been easy pickings for consultants, especially B2B and B2B SaaS consultants, because the rising tide lifted all ships. Companies were doing really well. They were raising tons of venture capital. There was money for all kinds of consulting initiatives. And if you had some brand awareness, there was demand that met the need. Now things have changed. And when I talk to consultants, particularly marketing consultants, a lot of them are struggling. A lot of them are trying to rethink their packages, trying to re-spark you know, the things that they need to do to get leads in the door. So I'm curious about the approach that consultants need to take in terms of they need to hustle now and they just can't wait for their inbox to start popping up with leads. So what kind of approach strategically and tactically should consultants make to deal with the economic realities? It's interesting because, you know, in every, uh, um, every type of economic situation, there are businesses that do well and businesses that uh, tend to struggle a little bit. Right now, if you look at IT consulting, for example, you, you gave an example of marketing consulting, but IT consulting is, is flourishing right now, uh, as it was you know, uh, ever since the pandemic started, I mean, even before that. But uh, there are different realities in the market because you know, in every market, it's about, it's about demand and supply. Right, right now, perhaps in, in, in the marketing consulting world, uh, things are shifting a little bit in, uh, in B2B SaaS, uh, let's say. So I, I believe that... In as in any business, like I mentioned, consulting business owners should reevaluate what, what their story is and reevaluate uh, what's going on in the marketplace. And to, you know, if, they, if, if required, challenge assumptions that buyers or, and potential clients um, uh, are making currently in the marketplace and align their stories accordingly. So um, I would say that you know, if consultants are struggling, and first of all, there's always opportunity when there's change, right? Economic uh, change, political change, whatever the change is, there's, oh, there's, always, there's always opportunity for experts and advisors when there is change. And even, you know, 
not to mention te technological change. So the opportunities are out there and it's up to consultants to go out, to go out and make a case for themselves and challenge assumptions in the marketplace. If they feel that their potential clients are hesitant to hire consultants now, then the first, the first place you want to, uh, the first question you want to ask is why? And more often than not, that will lead you to the assumptions that buyers make uh, with respect to hiring consultants. And through your stories, through your content, through your salesmanship, through your you know, um, uh, messaging, you want to make sure that you challenge those, those assumptions, um, talk about the, the, the consequences of the status quo, uh, talk about what is possible doing things uh, a different, in a different way, um, talk about uh, the opportunity costs involved, and uh, essentially broaden your horizons, go out and meet as many people as you can, and um, you know, just distribute that story, essentially. Let's focus on the stories and the messaging that consultants need to embrace these days. Now, if you go back two years, a lot of companies were, B2B companies were focused on growth and how to accelerate sales. And suddenly the economic landscape shifted and it was all about cost savings and productivity. We went through two years of a bull market. Everybody was doing well. But now we're at a time when a lot of companies are really scrutinizing their budgets and trying to figure out where they should spend their money, where they should pull back. If you put yourself on the other side of the, of the, of the fence and you're a consultant and you're trying to align your services with how customers feel right now, what are some of the marketing and sales themes or topics that consultants should be embracing? Because what you want is you want to match your services to what customers need right now. So do you have, do you have any thoughts in terms of how the, for lack of a better word, the editorial approach that consultants are taking needs to shift? Yeah, I think uh, so. Uh, let's talk uh, tactically. Right. So if there is a feeling in the marketplace um, among buyers that they want to, you know, uh, scrutinize their budgets or they want to not, not spend right now as they were doing two years, two years ago, I think that consultants should, um, you know, look at their offerings and, and, and structure their offerings differently. I'm always of the opinion that in any consulting engagement, you want to start off with a shorter project, a discovery engagement that is something like an assessment or an evaluation or an audit, right? So um, when the going is good, you, if you're lucky, you'll get a one-year engagement, right? Right off the bat. But now when, if you feel that your market is circumspect, then I think that consultants must zone in and really focus on uh, getting their foot in the door using very targeted and thoughtful, thoughtfully crafted uh, discovery offerings. You know, perhaps a 30-day engagement that provides some meaningful insight at the end, which, uh, you know, buyers probably wouldn't have otherwise. Or using some proprietary, proprietary knowledge and expertise, pro providing some result in a very short period of time. It doesn't even have to be 30 days. You know, I know consultants who have discovery engagements that last, you know, eight hours, a one-day workshop or an evaluation or a two-day workshop. And then what that does is that allows the client to understand the value of that individual or that team. It allows the client to look at their work ethic, to understand the quality of their work, and of course, the results that they've got. And you know, that for the consultant will provide, will provide them with the opportunity to open up a, a longer term arrangement. So I think that now is the time, if you feel that in your market, buyers are hesitant to take to to kind of open up the uh, their coffers and and get you in for a 12 month contract or a consulting engagement then uh, think about those shorter term uh, engagements as a foot in the door that's an interesting observation because it's an approach that i've taken with my own business during the good times i was selling full-blown fractional cmo offerings and and the prices for that were very good i'm, I'm sensing that the, the market's shifting so what i've done in my business is focus on offering a positioning, messaging, and customer targeting package. It lasts four to six weeks. It gets my foot in the door. It's not a major financial commitment, but it does give people a taste of what I do. So it's sort of like dating before you get married. And in talking to a lot of 
other consultants, they're feeling the same way is that the demand for high ticket items has declined and they're, they're having to come up with new ways to repackage themselves. And I think that's a, that's a very big challenge to find the products that your customers want to sell these days. Yeah, and, and this comes back to what I've been talking about for a long time. Um, you know, as you know, I uh, I coach and train uh, management consultants and other types of business consultants to land uh, new clients and build their businesses. And the what I find is that consultants, like any business owner, they, they come with a with a technical background. Like you're you're you have a technical skill or expertise, and you do that really well. And then you know you start a consulting business one day because you're attracted to the freedom and you know time freedom and financial freedom and, and so on and so forth. But uh, very soon you realize that, you know, there's a whole a different aspect to running a business. When you start a consulting business, first and foremost, you're running a business, right? A lot of, cons- a lot of people think that when they started, when they get into consulting, the work's going to magically appear and they're going to be so happy doing what they love doing. But then um, the the challenge is, you know, how do you get work to uh, how do you how do you get work to come to you? Uh, how do you like you know uh, increase the value of your services? How do you find the right prospects? And and more importantly, how do you do all of this while you're delivering cl- uh, consulting engagements? The the thing that uh, you know I'm really big on is that I feel that consultants uh, must learn sales and marketing, right? They they must learn the nuances that make up these functions because you know sales and marketing are functions that drive business growth right uh and when you start a business you got two only two functions that you uh that you kind of uh play in one is operations because you're delivering engagements that's full the operations of fulfillment and two is sales right you meet a customer or a client randomly through a referral you make the sale and you fulfill so it's always sales and fulfillment and oftentimes clients get, I mean, consultants get stuck in, in this, you know, cycle of sales and fulfillment. So what you want to be doing is introduce marketing as, uh, you know, as, as a skill in your business. Marketing drives growth. And marketing is not just all about promotion. Marketing is about understanding how to uh, know what your buyers want, what their worldview is. How do you craft a thoughtful offering? How do you craft messaging how do you position yourself in the market and then how do you go go and uh, uh you know acquire customers all of those things are super important especially for you know uh, small consulting businesses or small consulting business owners that often get hired for their own expertise which uh, makes them kind of you know do the work and sell the work to get out of these this kind this this kind of predic- predic- predicament where you know, suddenly the economy changes and, you know, you've got to like shift your business. You need to understand the nuances of marketing so that you can apply those rules and shift your business when external circumstances change. It's interesting that you mentioned the balancing act between selling slash marketing and doing, because I think a lot of consultants, particularly new consultants, struggle with the reality that you've got to do both at the same time. If you're doing the work and you're not selling, then your pipeline goes dry. If you're just selling all the time, then you don't have any time to do the work. I wanted to get your take on the idea of riches are in the niches. If you narrow your focus as a consultant on a specific area, then that'll allow you to really rally behind your sales and marketing. It'll give prospective clients a really laser view on what you do and how you can help them. Do you subscribe to that approach to consulting? So I do believe uh, riches are in the niches, but I'll add some context to it. When you start a consulting business, um, you know, often people start consulting businesses because they're in a position where they don't have full-time employment for whatever reason, or they willfully uh, start a consulting business because they're attracted to the lifestyle and, you know, the freedoms that that come come with it. When you start a consulting business, oftentimes you know things move so fast that you you're not in the, in the position to make that conscious choice of okay, here's the niche that I'm going to target from day one, and here's how I'm going to go out and get business, and so on and so forth. You know, you need to you need to pay the bills. You need to keep the lights on. And consultants typically become consultants, you know, when they've 
got a tremendous experience, right? So they're uh, they're not like uh, you know twenty year olds anymore. They they typically have have families to support and they, they have expenses. So when you start a consulting business, you've got life as a, as a reality in front of you. So it's okay not to start w- with a niche because that's the, you know, oftentimes that answer comes to you as you go along, as you kind of you know get more experience in in business. And here's the other thing, you know. The number one way consultants land clients in the early days is through referrals, right? Mm-hmm. Right from the day our industry started. When that happens, you tend to get referrals from various places. Sometimes you get referrals for different types of projects, right? You may be an operations guy. You may get an operations uh, project. Then somebody else wants some financial aspect of what you do, uh, some kind of problem to solve that way. Maybe somebody, you get another project which has project management component to it. So when you depend on referrals in the early days, you you get hit with different types of inquiries and needs. And because of the need to get keep cash flow coming in the door, you know, it's okay to take different types of projects in the early days, right? Uh, to understand the market and to keep your business running, stay above water. During those times, it's okay not to have a niche. Consultants should not beat themselves up and say, okay, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. Or maybe maybe I'm not good at this. I've always heard that you got to be focused on a niche. Maybe I don't know how to do this. But I would advise people if they're listening, consultants listening to this, and they're in that space, I would advise them not to beat themselves up. It's okay to take a couple of years to understand the market and understand your own expertise and skills and understand you know, where you like to play. And also understand where you get the best results. Where's your expertise at as an independent consultant or a small firm? And then once you, once you have that understanding of yourself and your business and the types of results you get, and also the types of clients you like to work with, then you can start thinking about putting together you know, a, a plan to select a niche. Here's the thing, like to have some kind of a marketing plan and to grow your business, you have to kind of niche down. Right. And you have to understand and you have to like, you know, pick your target customer. You've got to, you know, nail down the value proposition that you love for the customer. You'll have to nail down how you're different in the marketplace. If you don't know these things, then how are you going to build a marketing plan around your business? In order to grow your business, if you want to grow your business, then uh, it's really important to kind of nail down that niche. Otherwise, you can't have a marketing plan at the same time for five different types of services. Everyone likes referrals. It's great when they appear in your inbox and you pretty much close the deal before even talking to someone. I am interested in your take on the marketing side of consulting, particularly around content and understand in your view, how much content should consultants create and how do they know what kind of content to create? Okay, so the first part of that question, how much content they should create? And first of all, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, um, of content. Let's just uh, go back from the, you go back, go back to the, you know, the beginning of our industry, right? Like for, right from the time our industry started, like a few, a few decades ago. There are two ways consultants land clients. Number one is referrals, right? And number two is content. And in those days, content was articles in, in uh, trade bu- publications, speaking engagements at, at you know, chambers of commerce, writing books and getting published. All of that stuff is content. The higher, higher ticket you go in consulting, the more you get into that trusted advisor space. And when you get in that trusted advisor space, the thing that matters is that you know, people need to trust you. You need to have a reputation behind you. And you build a reputation two ways. One is you get great results for your clients. And number two is that you put out content and education that uh, tells the market that you know what you're talking about, right? So in terms of when it comes to the question of content, it's always worked in our industry. Um, It works even today. The only difference today is that the channels are different. Like you've got social, you've got content networks like like podcasts and stuff. You've got various other avenues to, to create content and distribute content. There's so much more opportunity to, to create and distribute content today than there were previously. So in terms of the first question, how much content you should create? I mean, it depends, right? Like it depends on, you know, the traction that you get. It's always when you start out, you got to experiment and see, put, put out content to your network and see what traction comes up. And how much content you create is also a function of 
uh, your distribution? Like, what is the size of your network? You not only have to create content, but you also have to think about how do you grow your network? Uh, and when I say network, it's your potential readers and your potential clients, right? Um, so if you have a huge network and it's a, it's a captive audience, you know, you can get away with, with posting very little content. But if you have a smaller network, then uh, you got to kind of calibrate your content to, to the size of that audience and make sure that, that your, your content produces enough traction to meet your business objectives. So I believe there's, uh, there's, there's a context involved when answering that question. What type of content to create? And this is interesting because, you know, a lot of people think that just by creating any type of content, you are going to land clients. That's not true, right? <laughs> you know, it's not true. Um, just look back a few years ago, right? I just talked about, you know, content opportunities that were, that were for the taking to you a few years ago, books, articles in newspapers, articles in business sections of the, uh, of newspapers, articles in trade publications, speaking engagements. I mean, imagine if you, you had those opportunities, you know, a few decades ago and you post content about, you know, random content that uh, you would post on your LinkedIn. That wouldn't go down well with, with the audience. When you post content, you've got to make sure that just think of your LinkedIn profile or think of all your distribution channels as, you know, sacred channels where you post your best stuff. Like just think that you're at a key, you're, you're delivering a keynote at, at a conference. Would you still post the content that you post just because people have told you that, you know, you got to post content every day? No. So I believe that the type of content that you post should, number one, be educational and provide some kind of value to the audience. If, you're, if, you're, if your content does not provide value, then just hold off on, on, on posting it. I always tell, say this to my clients, like get in, take, take on the role of an educator as a teacher because you know, as a consultant, you have, you, you have expertise in a, in a specific domain. When you kind of go out and, and create content, may just, just think of yourself as a teacher. What would you do if you were a teacher and what would you teach your audience? And at the same time, when you're putting out content, you want to make sure that you create demand in the audience, demand in your market. And the reason you create demand is that a lot of consulting is discretionary. You know, outside of IT consulting that, you know, do these large tech transformations on, and migrations, a lot of uh, high ticket consulting is this, this discretionary spending. There aren't executives like looking for consultants on a daily basis. There's, there's no compelling reason to bring in a consultant. So as a content creator, you want to you wanna create those reasons that buyers should have to hire you. And the way you do that is create, first of all, the, a compelling reason to change. Why should buyers change? What's going on in their world that uh, requires them to change? And as a result of that requirement, they go out and look for an expert to change. And following that, you want to talk about, as I mentioned a little while earlier, you want to talk about, you want to demonstrate that you understand their world. You want to really uh, demonstrate and talk about the symptoms that they're going through as, as a manager and a leader in the organization. Yeah, and you want to talk about some of the assumptions that led them to believe certain things that they believe about their industry. And you want to then talk about the consequences of staying where they are and not moving forward. What are the dangers and risks involved in that? Then you want to think of talk about what is possible. What could be possible if you do something differently, if you think differently? And then give examples of others in similar positions and similar organizations who've uh, met with significantly better results as a result of thinking differently and doing things differently. And then position yourself and talk about uh, why you're different and why you, will li you, you likely can take them to that that outcome that, that, you, that you talked about. Those are some of the things, some of the ways you create demand in, in the marketplace. You know, there's a caveat here. You can create all of this content, but as far as my experience goes, content takes time. You've got to be patient with it. Uh, you've got to give it at least a quarter or two before you start seeing traction. But once you start seeing traction, it can be really powerful as a lead generation mechanism and, and as a brand building mechanism. You and I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn, clearly, possibly too much time on LinkedIn, but I did want to get your take on LinkedIn, given the platform has evolved, given the fact that a lot more people have jumped on the content creation bandwagon. My news stream is overflowing with content these days. 
So the question is whether LinkedIn is still a good place for consultants to operate. And I'd also be curious about other platforms that you're using or exploring these days. Yeah, so LinkedIn, like any other platform, uh, has evolved over the last couple of years. Lots of content creators, like you said. And of course, things have changed. I myself have seen a decrease in reach uh, and engagement uh, on LinkedIn. And, and that's okay, because that uh, is an indication that I should be doing things differently. That pushes me to kind of uh, change and think about different tactics and so on. I've, I never expected LinkedIn to stay the same. So now that it's changing, the platform is changing. I'm, I'm really not surprised at all. But at the same time, I still think that if you're, if you're in B2B sales or B2B, um, if you're targeting organizations, uh, small, medium sized or large, I still think there's no other platform right now in terms, of a, in terms of social that is akin to LinkedIn, right? And also when you use it in tandem with Sales Navigator, which is a premium tool of LinkedIn and which I use a lot, the data that you get and the, and the kind of... Uh, uh, search filters that you get, the utility that you get, is uh, I think still unmatched in in the industry. I don't I don't know of a different uh, platform that does what LinkedIn plus Sales Navigator uh, do. So I still think there's a lot of value in being part of LinkedIn. One of the advantages with LinkedIn changing is that if you can figure out how to make it work while other people are struggling, uh, then you're an advantage. So it's still an opportunity for those that uh, have, uh, are feeling the same way where, and you know, feeling the, uh, the, uh, the change that has taken place with LinkedIn. And if, you, and if they're feeling that their, their reach has, has come, come down and the effectiveness uh, of, their, of their LinkedIn content has come down, it's, I think there's still an opportunity because uh, there's still a lot of activity. People are still doing business on LinkedIn. A lot of your content on LinkedIn is video driven. So the obvious question is whether you're using TikTok as another way to get ROI from the videos that you're making every day or on a regular basis. I'm aware of how TikTok is like taking over the imagination of B2B, B2B marketers. I haven't gone there yet. I know that a lot of B2B SaaS marketers are talking about it. The reason I haven't gone there yet is that I feel that the profile of my target customer for the for the type of business that that I'm conducting right now, I feel that I still haven't I, I still haven't kind of uh, reached the stage where I want to move into a platform like TikTok. I am experimenting a lot with YouTube these days, and I also am experimenting a lot with uh, with an online community where I meet with uh, consultants and deliver. Uh, an education, a long form piece of educational content every two weeks. So those are the two avenues that I'm, I'm experimenting with, with uh, these days. And I don't want to experiment with too much. Perhaps TikTok can work for me, but I don't know too much about it. But for just, just so that I don't want to kind of, uh, you know, be involved with too many channels at this time, for that reason alone, I haven't experimented with, with TikTok as yet. What about yourself? I continue to use LinkedIn. I continue to believe in the power of LinkedIn. Like you, I've seen reach and engagement decline. I'm not sure whether that's the algorithm rewarding different types of users or new users, or whether there's just more competition, or whether people are spending less time on LinkedIn as they did when, when they were working from home. I'm also playing with TikTok. Admittedly, I'm not playing as well as I should. I'm learning. I'm making videos and seeing what kind of engagement is happening. And I'm increasingly becoming, I wouldn't say the word sophisticated, but I'm getting better at TikTok. So those, but LinkedIn continues to be my, my bread and butter. And I also have a newsletter that I write three times a week, which gives me ground coverage. So those are the places where I play. We've spent a lot of time talking about consultants and how they operate and how they do marketing and sales, but why don't we shift the focus a little bit to people who may be exploring a move into consulting? What are some of the key considerations that you should think that they should be embracing? Like, What are the, some of the, the key questions they should be asking themselves before they make the leap from being a full-time employee to being a consultant? Yeah, the first thing that they should be asking themselves is what what is their core what is their expertise and 
have they got results for either you know their employer in a past life or you know in a one-off consulting engagement have they got real results can they get results for clients right it's not just about the expertise but it's about the ability to give your client a result so if they can answer confidently that yes they have X expertise and they can articulate the outcome and the result they've got for either an employer or a one-off consulting client that they that they had, then it's a good, it might be a good move for them to get into consulting. Because at the end of the day, like you want to, you survive because you get results for your clients, right? And if you can't get results for your clients, then you don't have a business. The other consideration is, as we've talked about a lot already, so I don't want to kind of uh, keep going over it, is, is the fact that when you start a consulting business, you start a business. So you want to be, you want to shift your identity from that of just a technical consultant to that of a business owner. So you want to quickly understand that sales and marketing are both involved. So you want to uh, shore up your skills in those areas because things change fast when you're independent or when you have a small firm, external circumstances change fast and you've got to know how to shift. Perhaps the third consideration that I want to talk about is that, you know, in a consulting business, as we've talked a little bit about uh, today is, is the fact that you're selling the you're selling the work and you're doing the work at the same time. Typically in the early days, your uh, clients will hire you for your expertise, right? Your, your, as a consulting founder, you know, your technical expertise. Uh, you've got to understand that the reality of the game is that you'll be doing the work and you'll be expected to build a pipeline. You've got to be very careful about how you structure your week in terms of, you know, setting aside time for client engagement, client engagements, and setting aside blocking out hours for building your pipeline. The way I do it, I do, I do a four plus one. And I've always done it. I've done it, been doing this for a very long time. Monday to Thursday, Thursdays are client engagements and project deliveries. And Fridays, I do various types of marketing. I, I, I focus on my business, right? So Fridays, I dedicate, I dedicate to my business where I treat my business as the client and I, and I focus on that. So I have my team meetings and my, my, uh, my operations team, my uh, marketing team. We all get together and we, we make a plan for the following week. So you got to have, you got to have, a, you know, you got to operate systematically is what uh, I'm saying. That's the third consideration. Love that approach. Love the idea of giving yourself time to work on your business. The other question I would have in terms of somebody jumping into consulting is how they establish a rock solid foundation. What are the key pieces they need to develop in their early days? And this could be having a website that looks professional, having more sales and marketing collateral that looks like you know what you're doing and creates a, a great first impression. Uh, using and promoting methodologies and templates so that people realize that there's a method to the madness is that you're not making it up on the fly and you're not doing things simply by the fact that I have the knowledge and you should trust me. So are there some key pieces that consultants, new consultants need to put in place to make sure that they move forward with confidence and more important, make prospective clients feel confidence in their ability to deliver? Yeah, so I'm just going to go back to, you know, the results, right? So the key pieces, you know, work back from the, the result that your client wants and, you know, put together the, your methodologies and frameworks that would help you get those results. Because in the early days, you want to make sure that you build a reputation and the, the, the best way to build a reputation is by getting client results. Understand what outcomes or results each client wants and make sure that they are satisfied that they and, and they get that outcome. Because as I mentioned in the early days, your business you know grows on the basis of referrals and not just new referrals, but existing clients giving you calling you in for more work. Right? That's that that's really important. So just make sure that and then laser focus on on getting those results and making sure that setting the set the expectations up front with a client that look, these are the outcomes that we've uh, 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 that we've uh, agreed upon and here's what they look like and then go and deliver them. We covered a lot of ground in the last 30, 35 minutes. Appreciate your insight and advice for people who are doing consulting and as important people who are thinking about jumping into the consulting world. Final question, where can people learn about you and the things that you do? 
Surprise, surprise, LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's my online hub as we've talked about today. So um, I'm happy to connect with uh, any of your listeners. Just let me know that uh, you heard me on Mark's uh, show, Marketing Spark, and uh, you know, let's connect. Well, thanks, Fahim, and thanks to everyone for listening to another episode of Marketing Spark. If you enjoyed the conversation, leave a review, subscribe via Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app, and share via social media. To learn more about how I help B2B SaaS companies as a fractional CMO, strategic advisor, and with positioning and messaging, email mark at markevans.ca or connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll talk to you soon.